Welcome to episode 205 of the Grip Strip Podcast, the Penske Perfect and the Rematch edition of the Grip Strip Podcast. My name is Philip Matthew. I'm your host, and I'm with my co host, a guy who went to the Rolex 24 at Daytona, but he's also an iRacing Indy 500 champion, a computer genius, a gentleman, and a scholar. His name is Joshua Fine. How's it going, brother? I am doing great, Phil. Of course, uh, went to the Rolex 24. Uh, saw the race there, had a great time uh, with all my friends there, uh, and of course uh, got to not only take a picture with Bozzi, uh Tatavarik, but also uh, I was in, someone else took a picture of me taking a picture with him, so a little photoception there, so um, we'll talk about that later, uh, a lot of stuff that happened in that race and everything, but you know, for you, San Francisco 49ers are in the Super Bowl, the first time in this history of this show that one of our teams made it to the NFL championship game here. Uh, so rooting for you here and rooting for the 49ers to go and uh, make it and win the Super Bowl, hopefully. Yeah, believe me, I was I did not think at halftime that that was going to happen. I can't really believe that it did happen. I'm still kind of in shock. My uh, my not feeling at 100% probably doesn't help with that, but it, I guess that's what happens. This old age shit, when you're getting, when you're turning another year older, you get more uh, sensitive to different things, but fuck. Watching the 49ers become the cardiac kids over the last two weeks has uh, taken a couple of years off my life. Uh but either way, they're going to Super Bowl 58, and they get to go and play Kermit the Frog, Tra- Uncle Travi, and uh, Kansas City Chiefs, Andrew Ryad and his Nuggies, Steve Spagnolo, and probably one of, if not the best defense in the NFL, a rematch of Super Bowl 54 which the Niners were leading with seven minutes to go with a 10-point lead and um, blew that game. Hopefully it goes a different way uh, for my sake and for all 49ers fans' sake. Uh, It's been 29 years today uh, since the Niners officially won their fifth Super Bowl. It was the first All-California Super Bowl uh, Super Bowl 29. It was in Miami, Joe Robbie Stadium. Yeah, look at Bridget Condon. Damn. Um, and it was and Steve Young on the first play from scrimmage through a what was it a skinny post to, to Jerry Rice and he scored, and that started what was a record six touchdowns in in a Super Bowl that hasn't been broken ever since. And the Niners won 49 to 26 that day. Now, two weeks from now, if the Niners can come back and do that, go and win, we'll make up for these two uh, most recent appearances, which have been heart heart wrenching uh, to say the least. And uh, so we'll talk about it more uh, next week in terms of a full-on preview. We'll get into it, though. We'll talk about both games that took place yesterday, the AFC Championship game and the NFC Championship game, a tale of two halves in the NFC Championship game. Uh, Lamar Jackson coming up small uh, yet again in a big spot, even though he's going to be the MVP of the league. Uh, But, you know... Brock Purdy had one bad game, and they said he can't be the MVP of the league. It's interesting to me how that works. Um, But then I think the guy that he hands the ball off to should be the MVP of the league, because he is. Um, But the writers really don't know what they're doing. Uh, We'll talk about the Rolex 24 at Daytona, which ended three minutes early. And uh, I don't think it really... changed any of the results of who was going to win in any of the classes um i think nbc or imsa combined to say yeah we're going to run out of time before we had to go to figure skating or whatever the hell they had to go to at two o'clock and so they wanted to make sure they got all the interviews in with all the different winners 
so they cut the race short three minutes early. The Penske Porsche number seven, you know, gets the overall victory, which um, was huge. Felipe Nazar, former Formula One driver, his teammate last year, Matt Campbell, his teammate this year, the American Dane Cameron coming back from Europe, racing in the World Endurance Championship. 15th try to win the Rolex 24, and he finally gets it. And, oh, the Indy 500 champion. I got the Indy 500 champion 164 diecast for Joseph Newgarden the day after he goes and wins a Rolex watch. Uh, so pretty big deal there for Joseph Newgarden, getting himself into territory, which is literally A.J. Foyt, Mario Andretti, um, I mean, I think they brought up all the rest of them, and Alan Sir Jr. and and the like that have been Indy 500 champions and also won the Rolex, Juan Pablo Monteri, or et cetera, et cetera. But um, we'll get in all the results there in all the classes, talk about uh, storylines that came out of that, as we'll have a decent wait, a good uh, six weeks or so between this race and the 12 hours of Sebring. Um, we'll get into motorsports updates with Formula E in Saudi Arabia, double header there, Super Motocross at Anaheim 2. They had a triple that uh, the, I forget what they call that, uh, the format that they had there. Um, Rally Monte Carlo starting the World Rally Championship season and, and any other news that's going on. And we'll preview and make our picks for the Bushlight Clash at the Coliseum. Um, see how that all goes. Um, you know, there will be, I think, every chartered car is going to show up. 23 of those 36 cars will be in the main event. So it'll be a very tight pack field there and it'll probably be a demo derby like it has been through every year so far josh will let us know all things going on in the world of i racing and gaming in a sim segment and we'll close the deal so yeah let's start with the football the afc championship game i will admit that i won because i was watching the rolex and then i wasn't feeling too hot i didn't really look at the game um, I only checked the score at halftime, saw it was 17-7, to Kansas City. Didn't know the storylines of um, Zay Flowers going and diving into the end zone and promptly fumbling the ball, um, which was a, probably a 10-point uh, turnaround or at least a 7-point <laughs> turnaround uh, because it... If he had scored there, it would have been, I think, a 17-14 game there. And it might have been a totally different scenario. Uh, Lamar Jackson, uh, who's going to be the MVP of the league uh, in this spot, wasn't able to uh, beat Kermit the Frog. And um, I said it last week in my picks, I... I Finally, it was like, I can't pick against the guy. I picked against him for God knows how many times, and he always wins. Uh, I have a bad feeling, you know, like if I pick against him next week, uh, even though it is my favorite team. But, you know, we'll see what happens with all that. But tra but freaking Kelsey, that tool, got a couple of touchdowns or whatever the hell or broke a record that Jerry Rice had. He was talking shit. His uh, significant other, who shall remain nameless, ended up flying in, um, and they showed her probably about 30 times. I think there's going to be uh, props. Um, Ariel Epstein can probably go and make one of her props off of how many times they're going to mention or show the the woman that shall remain nameless that is very famous and is great at singing and has three and a half hour concerts um, and also fucks Travis Kelsey. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the end, Baltimore 
they were the best team for the vast majority of the season, Josh. But there's just something about old Kermit the Frog. When it comes down to having to clutch up, he's the new Tom Brady. He's the new age Tom Brady. Four Super Bowl in six years as a starter in the NFL. Andrew Ryad, um, who is now a Hall of Fame. I mean, he was probably a Hall of Fame coach just with his Philadelphia um, credentials. But then winning the Super Bowls now is just gravy and with him it's plenty of gravy since he has a body that looks like he's ate his fair share of it um kansas city gets to go to another super bowl at the expense of the baltimore ravens yeah that was a interesting game there to watch uh i actually uh was listening to the first half of that game in the car coming back from the rolex there so uh you know i was just hearing what was happening of course and of course, uh, Travis Kelsey and the Chiefs scored on their first possession uh, of the game. Uh, the Ravens had the ball first. They uh, weren't able to come up with anything. And uh, later on, you know, Lamar Jackson was able to work some magic to tie the game with his long touchdown uh, to the right corner of the end zone to Zay Flowers off a, a, a scramble drill in there. So uh, I was looking pretty close there, but uh, I think, you know, just turnovers by... You know, Lamar Jackson in the first half, uh, and then the second half, uh, Zay Flowers uh, fumbled while extending there. So, you know, another week where a guy tried to extend uh, into the end zone and fumbled the ball. Uh, this time the Chiefs fall on the uh, fortunate end of that. You know, last week uh, MVS was the one that fumbled the ball uh, there at, at, you know, at the goal line for the Chiefs uh, and gave the Bills a chance. Now this week, Zay Flowers goes and tries to extend and, uh, gives a gives up a chance to score a touchdown probably uh, for the Ravens. So you know a lot of a lot of discourse online about you know whether you should extend for the end zone or not or for just the first down. So uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of opportunities there that the Ravens had throughout that game to get get there. And uh, I think you know also you have to really give a lot of credit to the Chiefs defense. Uh, Steve Spagnolo called a really good game uh, there on defense for uh, the Chiefs, and it's just really hard for the Ravens to move the ball consistently. Um, you, know, you saw in the second half, uh, you know, they really needed a, a chunk play for the Ravens to get back in it to score quickly, so that they would have time at the end. And you saw in their uh, last possession there, where I think they ended up getting a field goal or settling for a field goal. You know, they just took off too much time there on the clock uh, to possibly come back and win it uh with the chiefs uh eventually getting that long pass play to uh mvs there at the end so um yeah just a you know tough tough defense that they uh went up against now and you know tom or patrick mahomes playing like tom brady uh in this uh super bowl or well this playoff run here taking the the short uh, intermediate passes and you know we haven't really seen too much of you know no look passes and stuff like that. His offense has definitely changed, and uh, Isaiah Pacheco, very physical runner uh, there. So um, you know, it's a tough game for them. You know, especially the second half. You know, they only had until I think their last passing play. They only had 62 total yards of offense in the second half. But uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, the uh, the Chiefs. You know, their defense uh, just was more effective in preventing the Ravens scoring uh, in that game. So um, yeah, just a uh, uh, defensive stand by by the Chiefs, and you know now they uh, make it back to the Super Bowl, and um, probably the worst outcome that you know people wanted to see, of course, with the Chiefs making it back. Uh, I think people wanted the Ravens and the Lions to uh, make it to the championship game. So um, you know this was definitely you know especially considering all the circumstances, considering who's in it and everything. I think definitely the Chiefs uh, for sure. But you know now we get to see a, a rematch here of uh, the 2019 Super Bowl, and you know a lot of uh, very, very much a rematch because that was an election year when that happened, and we're now in an election year again. Um, I don't know if this also foretells that we're going to have some kind of pandemic again. Hopefully not. Yeah. But you know, no, that happened not. too. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. <laughs> Yeah, when I saw that, I'm like, oh, God, the whole pandemic thing. And then 
I mean, after the last general election there, how bad that was in general for many reasons. Um, talking about that, now we're going back in 24 and we're having the same kind of bull crap. But um, I think the pandemic part, you know, we'll say fingers crossed that we're not going to, I don't think anybody, I think 30 or 40 percent of the uh, country is not going to lock themselves down anyway. So whatever. Uh, but yeah, either way, Kansas City getting through, winning on the road two games, Kermy going and uh, slaying another uh, deal, not having a home, not being at home for the first time in his um, career. And he goes out and wins a team that at times this year you could make an argument was not very good, especially on the offensive side of the ball. Um, to go and put it together here in the playoffs speaks to, you know, that combination. It speaks to Patrick Mahomes. It speaks to Andy Reid and, uh, you know, Travis Kelsey coming out of hibernation uh, and deciding to play when he isn't talking since he seems to talk way too much. be nice if somebody would hit him right in his mouth. Um, but either way, Kansas City goes and they get to yet another Super Bowl, fourth in six years. And uh, that was the precursor to the NFC Championship game, which um, in the first half, the Detroit Lions uh, knew that it was the NFC Championship game. And the San Francisco 49ers uh, were asleep or something. Uh, they were completely outclassed in the first half. Um, Detroit just basically ran roughshod on them. Jared Goff looked as good as he probably ever has in his career. Um, you know, whether he was handing the ball off to. Gibbs or Montgomery, whether he was throwing the ball to Amon Ross St. Brown or one of his other receivers or Sam Laporta, of course, that's who he really throws to a lot. Um, he threw, he did a end around to Jamison Williams. They score in four plays to start the game. Uh, they were up 24 to seven at halftime and I was feeling really depressed. I wasn't feeling good. I thought that it was I really he was in bad shape um that we're going to go lose to the freaking Detroit Lions uh and put the record in the NFC Championship game to 7 and 12 oh uh, there you go um and as I'm watching because I'm like there's nothing really to watch so I'm uh watching the NFC Championship game again uh so it shows I'm mentally deranged because I want to put myself through this all over again. But in the second half, the guy who's a game manager supposedly um, led the 49ers back uh, with this, with an assist, of course, from the guy who is the MVP of the league. And I'll keep on saying it uh, because he is. Um Christian McCaffrey is the four base is the base of the 49ers offense. Ever since he's been with the 49ers, he's arguably been the best player in the NFL. Um, he does things with the football and the way he runs the ball or catch every just the way he plays is is unique, dynamic to only him. And he scored two tutties. It wasn't his best yard yardage uh, game, but Christian McCaffrey did work. GK only had a couple of catches for whatever reason, um, but he had key catches. Kyle Juszczyk had a couple of really good uh, catches. One toe drag swag special uh, in the first half, but in the in the end, Brandon Ayuk. Uh, was the guy who he made a the play in the second half where the ball bounced off of the cornerback's head 
and he caught it was the momentum, essentially the momentum changer. Uh, Dan Campbell was, went for it on fourth down a couple of times. It didn't work. Uh, he didn't choose to go for field goals, um, which, you know, who knows what would have happened one way or the other if that had went that way. Um, but Brock Purdy went and let him back. Christian McCaffrey did his thing. Brandon Ayuk. Debo Samuel wasn't 100%, but he was there. And hopefully with two weeks' time, uh, he will be closer to 100% so that he can function. Uh, he had a solid game in his first Super Bowl, uh, but it's a different different time four years later. Got a different quarterback, a better quarterback, a better offense, a lot. But it's going to be the matchup there. Uh, they came back. They benefited from a Jam- Jameer Gibbs fumble right after they went and scored. And they tied the game up. They took control of the game in the second half. And uh, even though their defense really couldn't stop anything most of the, most of the day, um, Nicholas John Bosa showed up and knew his assignment and played played well. Um, Greenlaw and Warner did what they had to do. The secondary struggled uh, in general, um, but I could say that for 49ers teams that have been in contention for the last 12 years, um, 13 years for that matter, and that was one of those passes that Jared Goff missed that if he had made, that probably would have been a... a turning point or game changer um he completely airmailed uh airmailed what is that is that uh gibbs I, it might have been gibbs or reynolds one or the other um he missed Bumble? a few balls no it was a few balls that he missed uh, i think it was to reynolds yeah yeah he missed a few balls there during the game that he makes those plays, then I don't know if we're really talking about this. The We're talking about it in this way. Um, but Brock Purdy, on the other hand, in the second half, hit what he had to hit. All the guys showed out. The defense did what they needed to do. Um, it went to, uh, they got it to, Detroit got it. They were outscored 27-7. Uh, in the second half, they got the touchdown to get within three points, had to get an onside kick, uh, weren't able to get that onside kick. George Kittle, after the weird bounce, after the weird bounce, gets the ball, and uh, he gets to have a chance at redemption uh, because he was, they keep on showing the clip of him saying he's going to be back and all that. At to the Super Bowl, and um, he'll get that chance here in two weeks' time in Las Vegas. And the fact that the 49ers won this game uh, is still crazy to me. Uh, the way that they played in the first half, it makes no sense. Uh, they've played two of their worst defensive games here in the last two weeks against Green Bay and Detroit. You add playing against Baltimore uh, on Christmas Day, and you can make the case that, what is it, three out of their last four games have been absolutely atrocious at times for a good portion of the game. I mean, Green Bay game, that game was basically bad for three quarters. Uh, the This game was bad for a half. The The... Baltimore game was bad the whole time, uh, but they were in the game through the first half. So, I mean, it's they're the cardiac kids these days, the 49ers. They get through Josh, and um, I don't, I'm not in the hospital somehow or another after all of that. Um, but yeah, San Francisco, in the end, they've been one of, if not the best team in the NFC this year and even if they haven't played to that level in recent weeks they've done just enough 
to get the job done and Kyle Shanahan trying to break narratives about him being conservative. Kyle Shanahan trying to break narratives about not being able to win from behind. Two weeks in a row, he's, his teams have won from behind. 17-point deficit in the NFC Championship game. Uh, I mean, the, that was the biggest deficit they've had since Colin Kaepernick led the Niners back in the NFC Championship game against Atlanta, in Atlanta, uh, to go and win that game and get to the Super Bowl against Double Murder and the uh, Ravens in what ended up being the the Lights Out Bowl. Um, but, man, I've said a lot here, but it's I, still in disbelief. I mean, I, I feel you there and, you know, it's a lot to take in with, you know, how that went down and, you know, it's only been, hasn't really even been a day yet since it happened. So, you know, it's still a lot for taking as a fan team going to the Super Bowl and all that. But, uh, you know, the Lions did have, you know, control for a good amount of that game. They started out, on, you know, on fire, going right down the field and going uh in, in the end zone right there with Jameson Williams and then, um, you know, later on they get another touchdown, they get an interception, and all of a sudden, you know, they're up uh, 17 points going into the half. So, you know, it took a lot there for them to come back, or for, you know, for the 49ers there to come back. And, um, you know, a lot of people are going to talk about the missed field goals and the, uh, you know, the uh, stuff like that. But, you know, really it is just uh, a lot that culminated in, in that decision um, or in, in, you know, in that ability for the 49ers to come back. Because I, I think the first field goal that they uh, passed up to go for uh, on fourth down, uh, I mean, I guess you can you can take it. And, uh, you know, they're up 17. It, you know, allowed the, uh, allowed the 49ers to get back into the game. But, you know, at the same time, you know, they're still far ahead enough where um, it didn't really change the game either way uh, other than... Uh, failing to take points on that drive. But, you know, then later on, you know, the uh, 49ers got a touchdown and then got, you know, got into uh, with seven, you know, up, you know, or 17 to 24 of still losing. And then they fumbled the ball for the Lions. And I think that was really what kind of uh, culminated there because now you have a short field, you know, then the 49ers get another touchdown there and then, um, they lost control of that game, and then Jared Goff also threw another interception. And so, you know, with all of that happening, then when they decided to go for it, down three uh, there, you know, I think you had to uh, take the field goal there because, um, you know, if you don't get it, then you're going to run out of chances. So I think the first field goal uh, attempt that they uh, passed up on, I, you know, agree with uh, going for it on fourth down. The second one, I think I disagree there because you know, you're behind, and you know with the amount of time left that you need, and 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 everything, it's it's hard to uh, you know come back and everything. So I would say, uh, yeah, the second one they definitely should have kicked the field goal there uh, and everything. But then also you know turnovers in the championship game, especially in the second half, very critical. So uh, those were very critical turnovers there for the Lions, and you know gotta wonder. You know a little bit about Jared Goff and everything. With, um, I mean, obviously, it was one of the uh, best seasons that he's had. But at the same time, you know, you wonder if um, if they re-sign him or if they extend him, if that's the right decision. And you know, I think Dan Campbell kind of said it perfectly in uh, the post game there to his team, saying we we may never have a shot at this ever again. And you know, honestly, that might be true. So um, you know, obviously, there's a reason why the Lions have never made it to the Super Bowl in uh, 58 years of uh, the Super Bowl existing. So, um, you know, obviously their only team that's been around for every Super Bowl, uh, that has existed for every Super Bowl has never made it. So, um, you know, obviously got to feel, uh, for that fan base and, you know, the Cinderella story, you know, finally comes to an end there and, uh, the 49ers make it back to the t title game, uh, and rematch, of course, as we said earlier with the chiefs and, you know, they've got a lot of upgrades now, of course. So, uh, you know, with uh, the 49ers, um, you know, Brock Purdy, who looked a lot like, to me, I think he looked a lot like uh, Harbaugh-era Alex Smith there, uh, circa the 49ers-Saints uh, uh, playoff game back in, uh, you know, the 2012 NFL, or 2011-2012 uh, NFL playoffs there with 
the way he was scrambling there uh, and picking up yards on his on his feet. Uh, very Alex Smith Harbaugh era likes. So, uh, you know, that was very interesting to see uh, him use his legs like that. Uh, and also, you know, he's got a hodgepodge of talent there. Kittle, McCaffrey, as he said, Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, uh, amazing catch there you know, off the face mask, uh, a 52-yard completion to uh, kind of get the comeback started. So, uh, yeah, it was a very, very uh, talented team there. That can, And also Kyle Juszczyk, you know, still one of the two fullbacks still remaining in this league. So, uh, you know, big big uh comeback there very talented team of course on on uh on there so definitely uh looking forward to this matchup here in the super bowl and seeing how they match up you know with uh the chiefs defense i think it's going to be a tough tough deal with the way the chiefs have been playing defense but i think on their defense i think you know they have what it takes to go up against mahomes there and uh kelsey and keep them covered and shut down the run with pacheco so be interesting to see um and everything so uh yeah look definitely looking forward to you know seeing this super bowl here in two weeks i think you're one of the only only ones it seems that aren't fans of that is a non uh niner or kansas city fan i think a lot of people on socials are complaining about it whether it's because of uh casuals yeah they're casuals or because of um the the woman that uh, dates Travis Kelsey or Kermit the Frog or the fact that it's the nine or I don't know I, whatever it may be um, I know I'm I'm plenty entertained um, even though they've tried to put me in the hospital uh, for I don't know how many of the most recent weeks um, the Brock per it's a great point you brought up there about Brock using his legs uh, was huge. Uh, they were playing base. Greg Olson kept on bringing it up where they were playing base defense. And when they were playing that, there was just enormous like space. And Brock, you know, on top of him being a game manager, they say he doesn't have any athleticism, but he ran pretty good. Um, and was able to go out there and do what he needed to do. Gaining all those yards gives them momentum. Give you can go and then run your offense accordingly. Give it back to McCaffrey. Go and throw play action, uh, which is the the crux of the Shanahan scheme. Uh, and they were able to do everything there in the second half and uh, shut that piece of crap C.J. Gardner Johnson up pretty good. Uh, shows yet once again why the guy's been on multiple teams in the NFL and he's still a fucking tool. Um he gets to go, well wow, that's it's a nice outfit on Aaron Andrews. Um but the Niners get the win somehow, some way. I and they are now going to the Super Bowl uh trying to get their elusive sixth Super Bowl to tie them with uh, the New England Patriots and the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, with the most uh, in the Super Bowl era. Uh, the only teams that are ahead of them are teams that existed pre-Super Bowl era, the Chicago Bears, the Green Bay, the Green Bay Packers, Chicago Bears, and the New York Giants. Um, Giants have the most Super Bowls, I think, think yeah amongst those three uh because they've won four yeah they won four green bay's won three or no they've won four okay they have the same amount all right so i'm just uh, thinking off top of the head chicago's only had the one super bowl uh so we'll see what happens with that uh we'll spend more time on the game next week on episode 206 of the gsp um in terms of i mean we've talked about it early preview i mean i i mean the key topics will of course be uh mahomes and his legacy uh being the new brady being the new face of the being the current face of the league 
uh, all those damn commercials, and uh, his annoying wife and stupid brother, uh, Kelsey, and the Swifties, uh, battle, and he, him barking as he always does, and then his, and then his big brother going tops at the, he'll probably go tops at the Super Bowl for everyone to see, um, since he wants to prove to everyone that, I guess that's part of him being in the, in the People magazine for, oh, whatever the, they, they have the, they say the best looking dude, so he wants to show off his bitch tits and everything, and that's fine. Um, either way, they should just, why don't you just go one step further? Let's go and see Andy Reid, and then that'll bring an eclipse in Las Vegas. Um, that'll be a good commercial for, for uh, State Farm if they go and pull that stunt, but they won't. Um, you know, Kyle Shanahan, can he go out there and actually call a game, a good game here, not a conservative game? They've been, they haven't been good so far in these playoffs through two games. Can they somehow or another put together their best game plan and best game here in the biggest game there is? Um, uh, uh, the uh, the Christian McCaffrey has one one more game if he can go out there. He makes his first Super Bowl. Trent Williams, the best offensive lineman in the NFL for basically his entire career, he gets his first opportunity at a Super Bowl. Uh, both of those guys are elite, elite. Christian McCaffrey's dad. Ed McCaffrey won four Super Bowls. Um, he won two with Denver, everybody knows about. He was on the field with his brothers when, um, and I think, I don't know if it was Christian or one of his brothers got lost. They lost <laughs> uh, both uh, Ed and uh, Lisa, lost track of a uh, couple of their, one or a couple of their kids there back in the day. Um, in the craziness that is the end of a winning Super Bowl. But in this case, can Christian McCaffrey do something his dad did four times, win win the big game? He won for the Giants. He won for the 49ers in that game, that Super Bowl 29, and also twice for Denver. Um, Trent Williams, I don't think when he was in Washington, ever thought he would ever get to a Super Bowl. And he's been close here a couple of years, NFC Championship game, but now they're there. And I don't think he wants to leave Las Vegas without a without a ring and without the hardware. Um, the defense, though, that's going to be a big, big discussion point uh, in general. The Kansas City defense has been the better part of their team for most of the year. Uh, Steve Spagnolo showing once again why he's one of the best defensive coordinators in football. They've acquired a lot of talent on that side of the ball. I mean, they lost Charles Amena, who was on the 49ers, was having a career year towards ACL yesterday in the a AFC Championship game, so that is a big loss. But they still have Chris Jones. They still have you know, other guys that are out there. They have Legereus Sneed. Um, they're not going to go away easy. Um, and when you look at the offensive side of the ball, you have uh, Isaiah Pacheco. And when you look at what the Green Bay and Detroit has done so far against the Niners defense, I don't see why Isaiah Pacheco wouldn't be able to do a similar kind of thing. Um, and then you have Kermit the Frog, uh, who... Didn't play a great game against the 49ers. He made two plays, really. And uh, one of them was third and 18 and, and threw one, then got one score. And really, that was what it was. Um, he did not play good in that game. But uh, Jimmy Garoppolo and the Niners gave it to them. And 
if he goes and wins this game, it'd be three Super Bowl wins out of four. And I'll continue the whole Tom Brady narrative. Uh, or if the Niners can go out there, get their first Super Bowl in 29 years. Um, we'll get into that. I mean, is there anything else you, you're you thinking, Josh, that uh, that I missed that we could – that we should kind of look at other than the props about Taylor Swift, since there's going to be plenty of Taylor Swift props going on. I mean, I mentioned last week about the fans and everything of hers and everything. So be interesting to see, you know, if the game doesn't go the chief's way, how they react on social media and stuff. Uh, but well, that'll be interesting to see, but uh, I mean, you know, for the Chiefs, I mean, their defense, you know, I think in particular their defensive players, uh, you know, Carl Aftis, uh, you know, he's been really good as a defensive end paired with uh, uh, Chris Jones there, of course. And, um, you know, I think Chris Jones would honestly probably be, uh, he'd probably have a lot more uh, fanfare around him uh, if it weren't for probably Aaron Donald. Uh, so, you know, I, you know, he's been really, really great, obviously, but, you know, him uh, on the secondary, the back end there uh, for Legereus Sneed, he's been really good since he came into the league. And, you know, I had him on fantasy all, all year. Uh, you know, he didn't really create a lot of fantasy points. But, you know, as cornerback play, he's probably been one of the best in the uh, the league and going into free agency this year. So, uh, you know, we'll see potentially a team like the Jaguars pick him up there in free agency if they're smart enough to do it. Uh, there, but um, you know he's going to be a, a highly sought after free agent uh, here in in March if the Chiefs don't uh, retain him. So um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see all that. But yeah, you know, I think those are a couple players on defense, and then you know uh, on on their wide receivers. I mean, Rasheed Rice has really uh, picked it up for them, of course, and um, you know with uh, Pacheco and everything. And we already talked about it, but. Yeah, I think those those players I think are going to be key for the Chiefs and you know the 49ers. I mean, we've already brought them up, so um, yeah. I mean, I you you said at the show like uh, uh, earlier, like you know, for for me, like I'm um, not disappointed in the 49ers making. It, obviously, but that's really because you know I'm rooting rooting for you and the you know for you to have some something and everything because now it's you know that's an opportunity, but um. You know, the Chiefs, yeah, whatever, you know, so uh, it's going to be interesting. But, um, yeah, I mean, I I think it's going to be a really, you know, for the uh, officials as well. I mean, they were complaining uh, for the Chiefs and Ravens game, the crew that they had there, uh, which is interesting because last year that was the crew in the Jaguars wild card game versus the Chargers. And the you know, first half was very suspect and uh, how they were calling that game. And this game, I think there was a lot of suspect calls there, a lot of missed pass interferences that they had uh, against the the Ravens or, or against the the Chiefs. Uh, you know, when the Ravens had the ball, a couple of missed holds that the uh, Chiefs benefited from on offense. So uh, that was curious. Now, definitely curious about uh, what officiating crew that they use here for the Super Bowl. And of course, you know, with it being in Vegas and everything, and the NFL embracing gambling. Uh, as much as they've ever had, you know, it's going to be very interesting from uh, that perspective, which we've already discussed here in, in past shows. So, you know, definitely, uh, you know, looking forward to seeing all that for sure. Yeah, and we'll get into all those details since between now and next week, they'll have hashed out everything uh, through all the channels and through the socials and the like. Uh, but we are also a racing show first and foremost, and there was a big race that took place this weekend, one that you attended, Josh, the Rolex 24 at Daytona. You also got to meet one Daryl Wallace Jr. and John Hunter Nemechek uh, during the Michelin Pilot Challenge. So uh, photographer Bubba Wallace also got a lot of uh, good uh, content there, but you got to meet Bozy, the famous Bozy. Um, he didn't have much of a weekend because his car got destroyed um, early in the race. Uh, but in terms of the 24 hours or the Rolex 2357 at Daytona, 
Um, you can see it even in the clock time. It says <laughs> the they called it, and it uh, the winners were at twenty three hours fifty eight minutes twenty four point seven two three seconds. So there you go. Um, so that was, and they completed seven hundred ninety one laps. The number seven Pens Porsche Penske Motorsports team. Uh, Felipe Nazar, Dane Cameron, Matt Campbell, and Joseph Newgarden beating the Wheel and Engineering Cadillac team of Pippo Durrani, Jack Aiken, and Tom Blumquist. Uh, the third place finisher was the Wayne Taylor Racing with Andretti Dex Imaging car, which uh, I found out yesterday was Dan Doyle. Uh, didn't know that since his son was in the race. Uh, Dan Doyle, who was a longtime supporter of Wayne Taylor. And now I get where the benefact, one of the benefactors of Harrison Burton's career came from. Also, uh, Dan Doyle, who's sponsored with Danka um, for many years, uh, sponsored uh, Wayne Taylor while he was a driver. Now he's going to sponsor... Um, Jordan Taylor's uh, car uh, in uh, the GTP class here in 2024. They finished third. Uh, Louis Delatraz's teammate finished. Uh, Jordan Taylor, Jensen Button, and Colton Herta were the drivers there. Uh, fourth place was... The second Penske Porsche, Nick Tandy, Matthew Jaminet, Kevin Estra, and Lawrence Vantor. And the Proton Competition Mustang Sampling 5 car, Neil Yanni, uh, Jimmy Bruni, Piccarello, and Roman Dumas uh, finished fifth. So they were the last car on the lead lap. The JDC Miller Motorsports. Uh, Porsche was two laps down. They were in the mix for a long time, though. Richard Westbrook, Vanderhelm, Phil Hansen, Ben Keating uh, were the driver line up there. The BMWs had issues later in the race, but they finished seventh and eighth. Uh, the LMP2 winners, there were five cars on the lead lap in that class, but the LMP2 winners were ERA Motorsports, Ryan DL, and Dwight Merriman. Uh, but the guys that got the new, who got the big focus were 17 year old Connor Zilich, who used to drive for Shea Holbrook in the Riding MX5. Track house. Yeah, in the MX5 Cup and in Trans Am. Now he's a track house development driver. And then Indy NXT champion Christian Rasmussen, who will be driving Fred Carpenter Racing this year. Uh, those were the guys that got a lot of the press uh, because of how fast and how talented they are. And they assisted uh, the regular duo, of course, Ryan Dial, a longtime veteran and a winner, and Dwight Merriman. Uh, to get this victory. Crowd strike by APR comes close again. Seven seconds this year instead of a photo finish. George Kurtz and Colin Braun, Toby Sowery and Jakobsen. And then in third place was the Riley Motorsports 74 of Gar Robinson, Felipe Fraga, Burdon, and Felipe Massa. Uh, the inter Europe poll by PR1 Matheson 52 was fourth, and then the Tower Motorsports 8 car, which had uh, Scott McLaughlin, uh, finished fifth. Pietro Fittipaldi drove for the inter Europe poll team, the same group that won uh, at Le Mans last year in LMP2. Uh, two laps behind the winners were the United Autosports number two, which had. Uh, Paddle Award, Ben Keating, Nico Pino, and Ben Hanley. They'll be a tough team to beat during the regular season, though, once we get to that. 
in GTD Pro, the Risi Competizione Ferrari of uh, Daniel Serra, David Rigon, Alexander Perguidi, and James Collado get the victory over the AO Racing Porsche, number 77 of Heinrich, Sebastian Prio, and Michael Christensen. And third place in GTD Pro were, was the Paul Miller Racing BMW, Madison Snow, Brian Sellers, uh, Neil Verhagen, and Sheldon Vanderlinde. They had brake problems late in the race, uh, which set them back. They were in the mix to win the race or win their class up until that point. In GTD, the Windward Racing Mercedes, Russell Ward, Philip Ellis, Don Jay, and Daniel Morad get the win over the AF Corsa Ferrari of uh, Man Harryu, Miguel Molina, and K. Cozzolino. And then third place in that in GTD was the Conquest Racing Ferrari with Franco Costa Balboa. Can't even say that guy's name. And Alessandro Balzan. Uh, so good job by them. Ferraris had three of the top four. They were second, third, and fourth in GTD. And then they won uh, in GTD Pro. So the Ferrari 296 looks very strong, uh, at least at Daytona. So that was that. I mean, some of the drivers that ended up having uh, bad, bad days. I mean, the TDS Racing uh, number 11 had a massive wreck early in the race. Seth Thomas, Mikkel Jensen, Hunter McElroy, and Mielsi um, destroyed their car out of the um, bus stop chicane. Uh, you had... Trying to see some of these other cars. The Magnus Racing team fell out early. Harder Racing had, uh, with their GTD car, had problems. Um, the Gradient Racing Acura with Catherine Legg, Sheena Monk, Tatiana Calderon, and Stephen McAleer had problems. The zero one, the two they had big too. prototypes, the two big prototypes that had issues were the zero one uh ganassi cadillac which was leading for a good amount of the race early uh which is um sebastian bourdais renger van de zanda scott dixon and alex polo uh i mentioned the bosey with the vassar sullivan lexus the 14 the gt pro car got uh got damaged in a wreck that was caused by an LMP2 car, the high class number 20. Um, that was the uh, car with Jack Hawksworth, Ben Barnacote, Kyle Kirkwood, and Mike Conway. So they got knocked out of there. And then the other uh, GTP car that had a lot of issues was the 10 mm -hmm. car. And, uh, you know, they've been in contention the last three years they've won or they accurate won the last three years the wayne taylor team has been in contention over recent years whether they were in a cadillac or a acura but uh, their car shut off during the night uh ricky taylor philippe albuquerque brendan hartley and marcus erickson they had to get on a rollback and uh it was too much uh to overcome at that point the mustangs um had various uh issues of vets the corvettes um in their gt3 uh, debut uh, mixed results for sure um so interesting we'll see ford versus chevy they were fast they had pace but something that we'll see as the season goes on i think the development will make a big difference uh, as the season goes on, though, uh, with those. But, I mean, in the end, it was a Porsche versus Cadillac battle for a good amount of the race. Uh, Wayne Taylor, Acura, always seems to stand out and do well at Daytona. It's just a byproduct of the deal. But in the end, it was going to be hard for 
anybody that wasn't in a Porsche um, to really, or cat. I mean, the one Cadillac that was left, that wheel and engineering Cadillac was super fast the whole entire time. And Pippo Durrani is one of the best drivers in the world. Uh, he's proven it time and time again, no matter what car he gets into. And uh, he's a champion, multi-time champion for a reason. But even he couldn't uh, slay the Penske Dragon there. Uh, his former teammate, too, in Felipe Nazar, uh in the Penske Porsche team. A year ago, the Porsches were not good um early on in the season they had their issues at the enduros even with the amount of testing they had done and um as the season went on they developed and they got better and better started winning uh, got themselves in the mix to possibly win the championship at petit le mans uh this time though for the first time in was it 57 years they said um since Penske had won since Penske had won overall he won with Mark Donahue um overall and I'm forgetting the other gentleman's name that he they won overall so it was a big big moment uh Roger Penske's you know career in terms of ownership start and driving started with sports car racing so he was a champion in sports car racing uh, at NSCCA uh, before he became the multi-trillionaire that he is now. But once upon a time, he was a driver too. And um, him and Mark Donahue became one of the greatest combinations that ever existed um, until Mark Donahue's untimely passing. But... 57 years later, a Porsche is in victory lane yet again at the Rolex 24, this time with a Penske name on it, and uh, plenty of emotions connected to that group, and they had to work hard the whole entire time. It wasn't handed to them by any means, Josh. Yeah, that was a very well-fought well well, uh, well fought victory there for uh, Porsche Penske Motorsports and the number seven Um yeah, they were really fast so overall. Um, this was yeah going to come down to the either uh, the Cadillac, the thirty one, uh, or either the two Penske Porsches and the the six and the seven. And I think the seven just had more pace throughout. You know, especially as they got to uh, sunrise, uh, the seven was definitely hunting down the thirty one throughout that. Uh, and then you know they they got around him. Uh, so I think around sunrise or about that time, um, and the 31, uh, was behind the seven for a bit, but, you know, about an hour left, uh, with the race, Tom, or hour and 18 minutes left in the race, Tom Bloomquist had a big run coming out, out of the, uh, bus stop and into the turn three and four on, on the oval and was able to get around, uh, the seven there for the lead, uh, and, and they split the Ferrari uh, GT uh, uh, GTD Pro there and uh, in going into turn one and he, uh, he got around him there. So I, I really think the 31 probably would have had it in the bag uh, if, uh, you know, the last caution didn't come out with uh, the uh, 12 Lexus uh, blowing up there off of uh, pit road on the exit. So, you know, I, I think that would have been uh, the victory there because I think they definitely gotten ahead uh, quite a bit uh, of the uh, Porsche there. So, um, you know, it was definitely uh, competitive there throughout the entire race. Uh, you know, the beginning of the race, yeah, the uh, 31 and the 01, I think, were the class of the field, at least, you know, through uh, the first uh, eight hours or so. And then, you know, right around 10, I think 10 or 11, I, I think the uh, at, at, you know, real time PM at night. So about maybe uh, eight or nine hours the zero one uh was battling with uh the 31 for uh first place and then they had a uh, a flat tire there because they ran over something and um that was pretty much started the end of their race uh because they they ran off track when Bordes was driving and then uh went to pit road and lost a lap uh with the flat tire so you know that 
that kind of took them out of contention there. And then, of course, they ended up not finishing. So, um, yeah, that's kind of disappointing there for the 0-1. You know, they've been close last couple of years. Remember in 2022, they were, uh, or yeah, yeah, 2022. Too, I think they 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 were or twenty one they were very close to uh, coming you know to the finish and possibly winning that so uh, you know uh, missed opportunity they weren't as close this time but you know definitely uh, they had a really really fast car there and uh, thirty one of course uh, with with wheel and engineering Cadillac really really fast throughout the uh, entire event and uh, you know I think the uh, Porsche there I think they just they just had better pitch strategy of course the final caution they came out uh out of pit road first so uh of course you know they required less uh less time to charge uh for for them compared to uh the 31 which makes sense because 31 is definitely driving uh with bloom close behind the wheel very very hard in that uh previous stint there so uh, of course you know the accuracy um you know they they led some you know especially the the 40 uh, they were up front in the 10 they were up front very early you know after the first couple of wrecks there uh, in the race but you know I, I just don't think they really had the uh true pace uh compared to the uh you know bloomquist or in the 31 and uh the seven there so um yeah that was a you know really interesting to kind of see them battle it out throughout the in, uh, entire event uh of course but um, you know, seeing seeing the finish play out there, yeah, definitely questionable with uh, the, uh, officiating there with ending the race with so basically the Rolex twenty three hours and fifty eight minutes and you know twenty five seconds I think so uh, you know definitely a, a a lot that could have happened there but you know I don't really think the finish in any of the classes was really in doubt uh, when they uh, ended it early by mistake. And I do think uh, part of that was because I think the clock started at 140, but they didn't actually go green until like 142. So you have to wonder what what the error was there, why they didn't start uh, the race uh, at 140. But uh, you know it's part of it. So um, a little bit of a scoring error there, kind of amateurish, but you know it's still at the same time still a great overall race that you know you really shouldn't tarnish that. So. Um, you know, for me, a lot of fun there as usual, of course, you know, spent a good amount of time in the stands, uh, on the second day, of course, really, yeah, the whole time spent, uh, in the stands, uh, got to see sunrise this time. So that was pretty nice. Uh, got a few pictures and everything. So, you know, got pictures of the pass for the lead there with, uh, the, you know, that I was mentioned earlier with Bloomquist, uh, over the seven. So, yeah, that was good good battle for the lead there uh you know the first day uh got a lot of free shirts there the midway and everything um of course and um you know my friends there came with me of course again so um glad glad to have my friends at the track for this you know glad to uh meet Bozy uh pre-race uh and everything glad to you know get that picture and then have the photographer take the picture there for a little uh photoception uh, there, so that was pretty funny to see because I I actually did not even know that until a day later. Uh, you know when when that you know we were waiting for the finish tap and I just happened to scroll through Twitter and I guess I had missed it, but uh, then I saw you know twenty hours earlier Posey posted the picture of us taking a picture together. So pretty funny to see how that play uh you know see that play out. So uh um took a lot of pictures there as I said. You know gotta gotta give a shout out to our friend Joe Passero who. Uh, help me with uh, you know, give me some tips there on you know what aperture to use and shutter speed and uh, light sensitivity and all that stuff. So um, you know, he was giving give me some tips there. I was asking him for um, you know advice on that, and uh, you know, he gave me gave me a lot of good insights. So uh, uh, yeah, I know he's a bit of a race photographer as well with uh, you know taking it to the track. So you know, glad to uh, have that advice and everything. Definitely. Looking forward to try to build up that skill. Um, you know, took a photography. I've never taken really any photography classes or anything like that, but I had taken my camera last year and uh, I didn't really, I mean, I had good shots and everything, but I didn't really experiment with anything. But, you know, this uh, definitely was trying to get some good good shots there with, uh, you know, creating, creating a, a picture and, you know, being able to show the motion blur of the cars, the sense of speed and all that stuff. So, uh, glad glad to have gotten that experiment of course and um, of course yeah last week meeting Bubba Wallace and John Aaron Nemechek after their practice and everything which you know we talked about before but still glad to see 
two active Na NASCAR drivers. Uh, I didn't get to see Bubba Wallace when, uh, you know, he was taking pictures, but I know there was a few fans that spotted him and they got a picture with him. So, uh, definitely, uh, good for him and everything, but yeah, it was overall a good race. I'd have to say, uh, you know, very entertaining throughout, you know, had a lot of wrecks in the beginning, which I felt, you know, last year, last couple of years, there really hadn't been too many accidents or anything like that, uh, at least in the beginning portion, but you know, I think um, part of it might be because they, um, you know, me and Joe were debating this over text. I think part of it was because they paved over part of the grass and maybe that changed the sight line for the braking zone. And, you know, they just maybe weren't used to that. And even though with, you know, practice and everything, uh, just uh, still not used to that in race conditions. And when you're racing against other people, you know, you're where your braking line is going to be and uh, everything because they repaved part of the chicane, which apparently now they're going to, tear that up and uh you know pave all of that uh with grass and everything because of the ryan priest flip from last year so you know nascar ring another element uh of the track and everything so uh we'll see how that affects the racing next year but yeah you know, i definitely think that could have been a factor uh maybe they take uh some cues from charlotte you know that's what joe was telling me on how to paint the track for the chicane so that you can still see some you know, visibility beyond the curbs and everything. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out, but, uh, yeah, good, good race overall, you know, definitely entertained throughout, um, and everything. So, you know, hopefully, you know, be able to do it again and everything. And of course, you know, be able to, uh, attend, uh, again with my friends and everything. So, um, glad, glad to have gone and, you know, glad get that experience and you'll be able to stay overnight, uh, there on the beach and be able to, go there, grab some Waffle House and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, great, great uh, Rolex 24 hours for sure. And, uh, I mean, when it comes to uh, current day sports car racing, there's it's a great time now because uh, with all the different manufacturers involved in the GTP category, and that doesn't even include... Aston Martin will be there next year. Lamborghini is going to be there next year. Lamborghini will debut at the 12 Hours of Sebring. Aston Martin is going to bring their hypercar here as well. Uh, for whatever reason, Toyota and Ferrari have not um, decided to do that um, as of yet. Uh, but, you know, you consider all the, all the different uh, manufacturers involved there. And then GT3 is absolutely insane all the different manufacturers that are involved there um it's almost like uh a uh opening to what you look at with nascar and indycar and the irony is jim france runs both of these deals but one series is able to get a trillion manufacturers to show up and be a part of it and the other one has been looking for a fourth OEM for years and can't find one. Um, and they've made the cars more spec and this, that, the other. And um, they made them more like a GT3 car, to be fair. And they still can't get a fourth OEM. And, um, I mean, IndyCar is another one, which they were ahead of the game. They were before, they had a chance to get their formula out there before uh imsa got the gtp formula the convergence of gtp and hypercar together and they missed not only with the car but also with the engine and because of that we see where we're at um with a car that is now 12 years old uh engine formula which is the same uh they were gonna do hybrid but there, that's going to be delayed till after the Indianapolis 500. Um, like sports car racing right now, enjoy it, appreciate it. Uh, this is our time because I was too young to appreciate the GTP era in the 80s and the 90s uh, before that all blew up. Um, GTS was outstanding and GT, they had GTS, GTO and GTU. So you had three different classes, um, 
GTS was like unlimited. The GTO was over three liter engines and GTU was under three liter engines. So that was where um, you had so many different manufacturers involved in its heyday. And um, when it was sponsored by Exxon uh, Supreme back in the or in the 90s when I was watching, uh, when I first started watching uh, sports car racing, we have a good thing right now. Got to go out there, support IMSA races, go out there. I want to go to the six hours. I think it's it's more likely than it's ever been. So I want to go there and see those cars in the worst way. So it'll be cool to do that um, because we have a great thing here. If there's a series that has a lot, a little bit of everything, IMSA has it. So um, definitely appreciate it. We'll have some time between now and the 12 hours of Sebring uh, for a lot of these teams to go and go back, regroup, see what they need to improve on and uh, really get their heads down once you get to Sebring because then the season starts in earnest. Uh, the, uh, you know, we talked about the class winners and key storylines and all. Um, the error, of course, with um, with the calling the race early, but, you know, I, I guess they did a lot of things right. Biggest crowd they've had in... 60 something years of this race uh, to have a couple of to have a snafu like that unfortunate but in the end it didn't affect the race per se so um we'll move on to to the other racing that went on this past weekend uh formula e ran at uh saudi arabia in uh on friday and saturday on friday the world champion jake dennis uh, won the race and ran the fastest lap jean eric verne started on pole but finished second just ahead of nick cassidy in third sam bird mitch evans rounded out the top five Norman Natto, Gunther Verline, Sete Camara, and Robin Freins uh, rounded out the top 10. Uh, Jay Anderuvula uh, finished 20th. And uh, Sasha Fenestraz was the only car that DNF'd in race one. In race two, Nick Cassidy got the win. Um, and also the fastest lap by one, he won by 1.192 seconds over Robin Frines and Oliver Rowland started on pole, finished third. Jake Hughes, Stoffel Van Dorn making five different teams in the top five. Uh, Sasha Fenestraz recovers, gets the sixth in the second race. Verline, Jean Eric Vern, Maxi Gunther, Mitch Evans. Uh, your top 10, Jake Dennis finished 12th after qualifying 14th. Uh, the Mahindra cars, Mortaro is 11th, DeVries 15th. I forgot about him in the first race there. Daruvala fell out of uh, the second race there. Uh, the points, they're going to have six weeks break between uh, these races at Saudi and then Sao Paulo, Brazil. The uh, race in India got canceled. So uh, the point standings heading to Brazil are Nick Cassidy has a 19 or yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah 19 point lead over Pascal Verline. Um after two third place finishes and a win, uh, Cassidy and two fastest laps. Verline had the win at uh, Mexico City. In Jean Eric Vern is in third. Jake Dennis fourth. Mitch Evans fifth. Maxi Gunther sixth. Frines, Buemi, Roland Hughes 
Uh, huge gaps, though. 19 points for first to second, then uh, 5 points, second to third, 10 points, second to fourth, and then 17 points from second to fifth. But it's early in the season. And uh, we'll move to Super Motocross. A race at Anaheim 2. Uh, Super Motocross uh, Anaheim 2. The with the triple, the I'm trying to I'm forgetting the format or how the triple crown format. Cooper Webb wins uh, the triple crown for 450 class. Levi Kitchen wins in 250s. The results at uh, in. We'll just go and click there. And, um, answer that. In the uh, official results for the 250, Levi Kitchen gets the the win over RJ Hampshire and Joe Shimoda. Nate Thrasher and Jordan Smith uh, round out the top five in, uh, 450s it was Cooper Webb over Eli his teammate Eli Tomac who won the third moto uh, Jason Anderson who won the second moto um, Aaron Plessinger coming off of his first career win at San Diego and Chase Sexton who won the first moto and finished second in the third uh, but had an 11th in between that so two monster energy star racing Yamahas and two Red Bull KTMs there. The one in the, the meat and the sandwich is Jason Anderson on the Monster Energy Kawasaki. Points heading to Detroit. I mean, the West Series, the, the 250 West will be on break for a couple, a few weeks. Aaron Plessinger has a four-point lead. He'll have the red plate, uh, four-point lead over his teammate. Chase Sexton, the defending champion. Cooper Webb, minus 6. Jet Lawrence, minus 8. Eli Tomac, minus 10. Jason Anderson, 13 points back. Dylan Ferrandez, 18 points back. So, going to Detroit. And then in the 250 West right now, Jordan Smith and Levi Kitchen are tied. Uh, RJ Hampshire, 8 points back. And Garrett Marchbanks. 14 points back. Um, then once you get past those guys, it's a pretty tight race from fifth on back. Uh, eight points separating Bourdon to Mumford. The 250 East will start their uh, series here uh, at Detroit. Then there will be a... Then there'll they'll go back. Uh, there'll be a West race at Glendale, and then there'll be East. Uh, there'll be East races. They'll have a few races in a row. There are four races in a row uh, with Arling with Dallas or Arlington, Texas, Daytona, Birmingham, Alabama, and Indianapolis before they go back west uh, with Seattle, St. Louis. So we'll definitely get into that more as we get further into the season. Uh, the Rally Monte Carlo is was uh, the next thing. W World WRC. We go and see that there for Rally Monte Carlo. Uh, Thierry Duville. Looks like he got it. Yeah, so the final result, Thierry Duville wins uh, the Rally Monte Carlo over Sebastian Ogier by 16.1 seconds. Efren Evans uh, rounds out the podium 45.2 seconds behind in third. 
So Hyundai gets the win, two Toyotas behind him. The Hyundai of Otanak was fourth. The first Ford was Adrian Formo, uh, three minutes, 36 seconds, through 36.9 seconds behind. Otanak was 159.8, back and forth. Andreas Mickelson and Takamoto Katsuda uh, rounded out the the Rally 1 cars, the first um the first car in WRC2 uh, was a Citroen C3 Johan Rossell uh, in 8th. So the podium finished 8th through 10th there. The Gregoire Munster, the second Puma Ford there, finished 20th. And, uh, yeah, so some of these other guys, yeah, so that is that. Um, the next next rally will be um, I, just, I don't know I clicked on the TV thing so so they'll be racing the same weekend as the Daytona 500 uh, they'll race Rally Sweden on in the snow and the ice uh, they'll have uh, just over two weeks between now and the start of that rally. Um, Other news going on, Red Bull, RBF1, uh, the artist formerly known as uh, Alpha Tori, uh, Toro Rosso, whatever, um, they're going to have, they're going to have Tim Goss, a former uh, FIA, uh, Percy's chief technical officer, and then uh, Alan Permain, longtime, uh, longtime lead person at Renault. Uh, what was Renault, or what was uh, Benetton, whatever you want to call it? How many different guises they were? Uh, they um. The, so he they're both going over to that team. So interesting pickups there. Um, looks set to sit out the 24th season. Wow. So defending Supercars champion Brody Kostecki uh, is, is not going to be defending his title um, with uh, with Erebus Racing, tensions with Dean for some time because Decky having a major fallout, and then ironically that weekend's because uh, under contract for remainder of 24, and as things end, should he depart, looks unlikely to be released to join another team, unlikely to participate as even as a co-driver. Well, the other thing is um, for Brody Kostecki is. Even if he isn't running in supercars this year, which would be pretty sad, uh, considering SVG now, of course, is here in NASCAR and in the Xfinity Series, and the guy that he beat SVG to get the title, he would have had a chance to go and set, you know, get a repeat title, uh, but it looks like that's not going to happen. Uh, it's a huge loss to the series. Uh, makes it a lot uh, better for Ford, though, um, and their chances to come back after what was a god awful year uh, in 2023. And um, yeah, so there's so that's an interesting uh, turn of events uh, there. Um, what's it called? And you got. Costa reunites with Hines as copper manager and lens. That's with Lewis. Um, McLaren Norris stand together. Yeah, well, he doesn't want to challenge himself, so that helps. Um, Tech 3, MotoGP. Yeah, so that's the Gas Gas team as Acosta, Pedro Acosta, gets ready for his MotoGP debut. The Rock will be the Grand Marshal for. The Daytona 500. 
and so there's F1. Yeah, so that's what. That's some of the news there. Trackhouse launched their MotoGP team, uh, and the bikes are are red, white, and blue. So that's really cool, and uh, so that'll be nice to see someone to root for uh, on the MotoGP side since Trackhouse is involved there. Um, yeah, Josh Williams will be running select cup races for college racing in uh, 2024 along with his full uh, season in the Xfinity series um, loves RV yeah, and lane right yeah so you know that's will sponsor uh, Michael McDowell and Lane Riggs yeah they talked about that tech yeah, uh, Ray Fox here, the uh, rent tracks like that. Yeah, so there's some of that. Um, and yeah, not no news there. Yeah, Brent Holmes. That was ten days ago. Um, the clash. So that's uh, about it for the news there. So we can get into the clash. Uh, clash at the Coliseum. Uh, we have the entry list has not been released yet. So, but essentially the 36 cars that are the the chartered 36 will be um, in the field. You can uh, the only real changes that you can come up with are. Uh, some of the smaller teams had changes. Uh, Stuart Haas definitely had changes. Of uh, two of their four drivers are new. Uh, Josh Berry and the four car, and uh, Gagson in the ten. Uh, Justin Haley moving over to Rick Ware Racing in the fifty-one. Uh, you have Daniel Hemrick in the thirty-one. And uh, his teammate, at least for this weekend, will be Josh Williams in the 16 car. It'll be a, it'll be a revolving door of drivers again. Uh, Spire will have three cars this year with uh, the 71, which is Zane Smith. Zane Smith. Which, and he'll be, uh, he's a track house driver, but they've farmed him out to uh, Spire for uh, his rookie year. And then the 77 will be fellow rookie and truck series, former truck series driver, Carson Hosevar. Uh, that'll be those, that'll be some of them. Um, that's what I can, I'm remembering off the top of my head. So, Go to the chart. Yeah, Ross Chastain, of course, will be sponsored by Bush Bush Light. His first race uh, with the big sponsorship there after they spent many, many years with Kevin Harvick. Uh, yeah, John Hunter Nemechek will be in the 42 for Legacy. And... Uh, the Kaz, yeah, Kaz Graw will be in the 15 car, 25 races. Uh, other than that, yeah, I think everything else pretty much is stayed the same. Some sponsors may be added uh, for some of these teams. Uh, yeah, Kaz, Josh Williams, Chris Busher. Yeah, you got that. Nothing, yeah. Hunt Brothers Pizza has moved over to uh, Joey Logano. And uh, Air Force comes back to Bubba Wallace uh, after he worked with them at the 43 car. And scroll through some of these here. Eric Jones will have uh, Advent Health and then Dollar Tree Family Dollar for a good amount of races because they are connected to both um, Legacy Motor Club 
for all three Legacy Motor Co Club cars. And, uh, yeah, weather, you know, Focus Health will sponsor Smith for 20 races. WeatherTech will sponsor Zane Smith in the Daytona 500. So, yeah, Luke Lambert moving over to Spire. Uh, Matt Swiderski coming from Colleague and going to Trackhouse to work with Daniel Suarez. Um, ben Bayshore moving back up to Cup to work with John Hunter Nemechek after they had such a great relationship in Xfinity. Um, yeah, Travis Mack moving from uh, from Trackhouse to Colleague to Crew Chief the 16 car. Uh, yeah, Boswell, Hassler, Blickenser for yeah, so everything else basically is the same there. So I guess, I mean, we have to look back to the previous, um, uh, previous results, I guess, in, in terms of, uh, the clash since it, uh, went to the Coliseum. It's been kind of a demo derby, uh, but it also, you know, it, it, there's been Joey Logano went out there, won the race. Uh, you had, you had, uh, the, and then Martin Truex won it last year. Yeah. Um, so that's the two years so far. Um, probably, I guess it would be time there's more Chevys than anything so you'd think a Chevy you'd probably go out there win but it's really a lot to do with how you practice and if you're able to get the kind of pace necessary to get the job done there um trying to find those results uh tracks um what is it? Uh, L. L. A. Plus. Yeah. So they don't have it on here. Um. So I'm trying to find the results of the clash. You. Oh, I saw. Exhibition unclassified races here. Yeah. There you go. So. Let's see. So there's. I got it. Over here, practice qualifiers. Yeah, Bush Clash. Yeah, 2023 Bush Clash at the Coliseum. Yeah. So that is right there. And the go to the next one, right? Um, and run a two. Uh, 2020th. Los Angeles Coliseum. You got it. Yeah, I have last uh, the the 2022 one. Now I'm trying to just look for 2023 uh, NASCAR Bushlight Cash at the Coliseum. There you go. And then 90. That's yeah, so twenty twenty three Martin Truex gets the win. Uh, Eric Almarola won the pole from the he races. Blaney spun and collected Elliott Gibbs and Suarez. Blaney would spin two more times while Bubba led a lot of laps, spun and gone in a wall. Martin Truex would hold off Bald Spot Dylan and Kyle Bush for the win. Um, Reed Spencer, yeah, that was, uh, let's see if I can, yeah, yeah Holly Kane, official results, um, yeah, Drew X, Dylan, Kyle Bush, Alex Bowman, uh, and Kyle Larson, so four Chevys after Martin Truex last year. Tyler Reddick, Ryan Priest, Ross Chastain, 
Denny Hamlin, William Byron, Justin Haley, Kevin Harvick. Yeah, 27 cars last year. Now there will be 23 this year. Um, so that's, uh, I mean, I, I, it's hard to kind of make a pick, so to speak. I mean, there's only a couple of years uh, of, of results there, but um, I don't know. What are you thinking, Josh, in regards to picks to win and, um, and a wild card for this weekend's race at uh, the Coliseum? I mean, this is going to be a really interesting you know, third year in a row that we've had it and surprised that it's lasted this long uh, in this facility, but it is what it is. But yeah, I mean, we've had a couple of different winners, you know, with Logano winning the first year and Truex winning uh, in last year's edition. Uh, uh, I mean, if you go back to 2022 when he won, Logano won, you know, Kyle Busch was right there. So was Austin Dillon. So uh, in third place, and then they swapped uh, positions uh, last year. Kyle uh, third, and Austin Dillon in second. So uh, you know, one of those guys could be really good to uh, win. So uh, I'm going to go with Kyle Busch. Yeah, I'm going to say that Kyle Busch wins the uh, Busch Clash because uh, he's been on the podium both years, but just not uh, on the right spot. So yeah, I say he wins the. Bush Clash uh, at the Coliseum and Wild Card. Uh, we'll go with, uh, you know, we'll we'll go with. Uh, and this is hard because we don't have the full entry list, and so we don't know. But yeah, screw it. I'll go with Noah Gregson as the Wild Card. <laughs> yeah, you're playing with fire there. Uh, going with Gagson, uh, Noah Gregson, Wild Card. I mean, Eric Almirola did qualify on pole last year in the ten car with the there at the clash, so it's possible. I mean, he's out there to prove himself for sure, um, to say the least. So the so and let for me, you pick Kyle Busch. I'm gonna go and pick Kyle Larson uh, in terms of uh, short track racing uh, I mean you really can't go wrong with Kyle Larson in general but in the last 10 races less than a mile tracks less than a mile in length he has the best average finish 7.4 and uh, seven top ten, six top fives, two wins, and two poles. That doesn't count. That's not counting uh, his uh, his win at the um, at uh, North Wilkesboro either. Uh, he fair enough. Yeah, so he won North Wilkesboro in the All Star race, also. So I mean, you got. Uh, and he figured out Martinsville finally, uh, which had been a bugaboo for him for God knows how many years. And uh, he was able to qualify on pole at both Martinsville and Richmond, won at Martinsville and Richmond in the spring, and then qualified on pole. Uh, oh, no, that was in 22, sorry. In 23, he won both Richmond and Martinsville. And then finished in the top 10 in four out of the five uh, short track races there. Uh, that were, yeah. There's one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, because it's on dirt, because I said it was, they don't count that. So um, Kyle Larson to win for me. And then in terms of a wild card, um, it, it would have went SHR, whether it was with Briscoe or Priest, but you went with Gagson. So, um, that's, hmm, you know, uh, I mean, I don't know if it's stretching it 
I mean, I, does it really matter? It's the clash. Uh, I'll go with Daryl Wallace Jr. Um, uh, Stretching it, but we'll let you have that. Uh, I mean, that's if that's the case, I can I can change. No, nah, you no, nah, you know I, you, you already said it. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, well, because he did have a chance last year, led a good amount of the race, but that was coming off of the year before. He wasn't really a factor. Uh, and his short track results there have been, you know, so so over the years, whether he was in the 43 car or now in the 23 car. Um, so it's uh, something to see. We'll see. The Toyotas have had mixed results at the clash, so we'll see if uh, Daryl Walsh Jr. can get his year started off right. And uh, DWJ as wild card. Um, yeah, so that's that for, I mean, they don't have the, for whatever reason, they don't have the um, entry list up when everybody and their mother knows it's the 36 cars that are chartered are going to show up there. Um, I mean, I don't see what really is the holdup on that. It's sponsorships. Um, I mean, they can put blank. They don't have to have uh, sponsorships. They have blank sponsorships on the entry yeah. list, and then they end up having a sponsor on the car once you get to the race weekend because the entry blank usually is sent in like two, three weeks before the actual race itself. So right. either way, either way, we'll see what happens with that. Uh Josh, uh, it's your time now as well to talk about all things iRacing and gaming uh, in the sim segment. Yeah, so I'll start out here with uh, what actually at the Rolex 24, they, you know, a lot of the vendor displays had uh, their gaming setups there. And, um, well, I know one had I a couple of had iRacing, some had Forza or Gran Turismo, and uh, decided to stop by at the Toyota display there uh, in the midway and uh, went to the iRacing. They had iRacing on their uh, simulator, so I tried that and with the GR86 at Legacy Daytona and uh, with the, the Fanatec wheel there and the same uh, pedals that I have, except they're inverted, So, uh, but it's the same model and everything. But I uh, wanted to try out one because of the wheel and two just to you know flex on everybody else there, but uh, it didn't turn out that well because the brake pedal was uh, not not configured. I don't think it was configured right, and uh, at least and not used to how how uh, I was trying to brake or between how I have my brake set up and how their brake pedals were set up and everything. So when I touched, because normally I have mine pretty sensitive, so I don't really have to put in too much force to um you know put in pressure to the brake but there was like really had to push it to the floor to to get a good brake response so um you know i was just uh not used to that so uh oh well there but um more more or less being able to um i guess sample the uh you sample the fanatec wheel for possible future purchase uh, definitely, uh, you know, got that objective. So that the wheel felt pretty nice and everything. So definitely have to, you know, potentially look into that one in the future. So, um, you know, trying out the displays there. Yeah, that was cool. Uh, and everything. So, um, you know, that was the only one really wanted to try. So, you know, that was cool, uh, to be able to, uh, sample that there. And then of course, regular eye racing, you know, with all this stuff now, probably going to get back into the swing of things. Uh, of course, uh, Daytona 500 coming up you know, in uh, three weeks now for uh, iRacing. So definitely going to try to get into that. Uh, we'll have to be able to, you know, figure out my strategy for that setup. Um, maybe you might have a spotter there, so we'll see. Uh, and maybe that'll help me out this time to be successful, of course, you know, trying to crew chief, you know, the, myself and spotter myself, uh, you know, hasn't worked out in the last couple of years. So, because I've never won it, but of course, Indy 500 is a little bit different than the Daytona 500, but you know it'd be nice to add two titles to there on the sim racing uh, mantle, of course. But um, you know we'll see. We'll see if we'll be able to do it this year. Almost got it last year, uh, but wrecked out within the last 
uh, 20 laps or so. But, um, yeah, that's going to be interesting. But, you know, this week, of course, uh, iRacing NASCAR Class A at Iowa Speedway. It's a little bit short track racing here uh, to start out the year. Um, let's see, uh, the uh, Okayama Street Circuit or International Circuit with uh, uh, the MX-5 Cup this week. Uh, Draft Masters at Talladega Super Speedway with, uh, let's see, which car, the trucks. So that might be a little bit of drafting practice there if you can survive and not tank safety or I rating there. Uh, you know, the Mustang Skip Barbers with the Sonoma Raceway. Uh, that's a good, good challenge there. Uh, let's see, Olden Park GTVRS Sprint Series with uh, the Ford GT3, uh, Ferrari GT3. Uh, so, uh, Sprint Road Racing Series at Olden Park, a uh, 40 minute uh, race. So, that should be interesting there. Get a little bit of road racing down, uh, of course. And um, the Formula Ford at Lime Rock Park this week. Toyota GR86 at Willow Springs International Raceway. Uh, I guess the truck series, I guess they're actually at the LA Coliseum uh, this week on iRacing. Uh, so I wonder if the schedule will change here to update the real life schedule because I know for Cup they do tend to do that. So I'm very curious on when the schedule changes. Maybe it changes tomorrow. Let's see the schedule this week for Class A fixed uh, series. Looking at that. Uh, let's see, this week at Iowa Speedway, next, well, Long Beach on the schedule for Class A fixed. That's interesting uh, for the NASCAR, but that might be something later on. Uh, iRacing NASCAR series, let's see, series list. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, that's interesting there, but NASCAR uh, iRacing open series. So I guess they're starting out with uh, Daytona on the iRacing uh, NASCAR uh, Cup iRacing series. So the official uh, series there. So uh, I guess they're not doing the Clash, but it's in the Truck Series schedule. So that's interesting. But uh, with the Coliseum, so I don't know. Maybe try that. We'll see. But uh, not really a big fan of short track racing on iRacing uh, for whatever reason. But that should be fun. Uh and then IR, well, the IR18 in the Indy Fixed Series is on L Las Vegas. That's uh, that's questionable, uh, but, uh, I mean, I guess it works in iRacing uh, and everything. So uh, that's that's kind of interesting. Um, and, yeah, Formula Ford's at Lime Rock Park. Uh, there, like I said, uh, Global MX-5 Cup at Okayama Circuit. And uh, then there's also the... Uh, I guess weekly road racing challenge and MX five this week at road America. So I might try that in a 20 minute timed race there. So should be interesting, but yeah, it will be interesting here. You know, this, this year on iRacing definitely going to try to enter as, you know, when it, many special events as possible, you know, especially Indy 500 back on the schedule here this year. Uh, so a one year hiatus uh, turned out to be for that. So glad to have that on the, on the schedule again and hopefully you'll know, be able to uh, race on uh, that night racing as the schedule permits. Hopefully I have time uh, to be able to do that once that comes around uh, in May. So definitely looking forward to that, uh, of course. And, you know, as always, you know, we'll stream when we stream on Twitch uh, at you sailor too, and go in there and go see all the things I have. So, you know, hopefully we have some good, good results there, good moments on there uh, this year and everything. And, um, you know, of course, follow me on Twitter. I guess getting a little boost here, signal boost from Bozy. So thank you for that. Thank you to the photographer for, I guess, uh, recognizing that Bozy had a fan or somebody they want to go talk to on the, on the grid and everything and uh, being able to do that and taking that uh, great picture uh, there, of course, which, of course, you can follow at uh, JP Huffine and go on there and see all my stuff. And you can see all the uh, tweets that I had there uh, with the uh, Bozy and all that stuff. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, follow me on there. And then, uh, of course, follow me on or we'll follow our YouTube channel at uh, Gripshire Podcast on there, which we have all our episodes up there uh, to date. So, we'll be up there later this week and uh, you'll see uh, our review here and uh, be able to talk about it. So, uh, of course, uh, one other thing I will mention is the NASCAR 
uh netflix series does come out uh on july 30th or not july january 30th uh which is tomorrow so reason bring that up well uh at the july daytona or august daytona race uh you know they were uh telling the fans of the chevy display that netflix crew would be there uh while they were talking to ross chastain so possibly you could see me in the background so gotta tune in to find out uh for the netflix series and uh be able to see maybe maybe uh you know twitter famous maybe uh netflix in the background famous type thing so we'll see there so um definitely definitely gonna be interesting so uh guess look out for that and we'll see if uh you know they my face made it in there we'll have to find out but uh yeah should be a should be an interesting year uh for uh, uh racing in general definitely uh it's always uh good to get racing started in earnest uh rolex uh happening really kind of is that kickoff and um you're able to enjoy that you're able to get uh the bozy bump there so uh credit to you credit to bozy um always great to be on and do this together uh for you know now we're at over 200 episodes that's crazy uh but you know we'll keep on going with this deal um you can find me at pg matthew 28 on twitter you can find us at gripster pod on twitter uh we're also you can find me philip g matthew 28 on insta uh find the gripster podcast if not on our youtube page of course find it at philipgmatthew.com where you'll get the sound part. You can also find on my YouTube page the sound uh, off of the show as well. A um, little behind probably due to the health and work and stuff, so I'll uh, catch up with that, and we'll have the episodes out there. Probably get double the fun this week. And um, with that, we'll, we'll move on and we'll... Be back next week for episode 206 of the Grip Strip Podcast, which will be a Super Bowl preview in, in earnest, uh, talking about the Niners and Chiefs going to Vegas. Uh, they'll have traveled there. They'll have flown in um, and started the festivities by this point uh, around this time, Monday uh, evening. Uh, a week from now so we'll see what happens with all that uh, preview that we'll also review the clash what happened there who has the momentum if you can really take anything from a demo derby uh, going to the Daytona 500 and whatever else is going on in the world of racing and sports we'll talk about here on the Grifter Podcast so for Josh I'm Phil thanks for listening thanks for subscribing um, and we'll see you next time.